I'm going to start off um, with a, a bit of a motion and a bit of law, because that seems central to this conference. Um, the book I wrote, um, Love's Promises, um, argues that love and contracts can be spoken of naturally in the same breath, and to show that, not just tell it, but show, because I think language makes an immense difference. I wrote part of it in the language of memoir, with the idea that a reader, maybe an adoptive parent or prospective adoptive parent who is reading about my proposals about open adoption agreements can feel as well as think about them and really honor both parts. I was really struck by this morning's conversation that law students think social workers are inefficient and care too much about emotions and the social workers think that the law students are way too brisk. So hopefully this is a bit of both. It occurs in, uh, um, in uh, 2003, I have been trying to get pregnant for a year. I am 39 years old. I have had no luck, and so I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to manage to adopt as a single lesbian who lives in Utah. Wow. <laughs> Against all odds, I hear, before my criminal background check is done, I hear from a college friend that there is a pregnant 22-year-old lesbian in Utah who wants to relinquish to gay parents. So everything is surprising. This is called Interview with a Birth Mother. Is this a good time to talk, I ask, sounding like I'm trying to get something out of her? I am. I want her to give me her baby. Little guessing that I'll manage to get pregnant myself before long. We talk a few minutes, me asking her age, 22, how the pregnancy has progressed, fine, trying to be friendly and sympathetic, wondering if I'm breaching protocol. I ask her name. Connie, with an I, she responds definitively. Over the next two hours, I find out that she and her now ex-girlfriend wanted to have this baby together, but broke up over what Connie calls her anger management issues. She had sex with a friend to get pregnant and can't keep the baby because a battery arrest disqualifies her from working on her old job as a security guard. She's living with her dad who thinks she's too immature to be a mom. Ooh, she coos as I explain that I'm a professor and could provide love, stability, and flexibility. Interrupting myself, I ask what's happening on her end and find out she's opening a purple onesie from her aunt. As I resume describing myself over the rustle of tissue paper, she interjects, that's all really impressive, but I don't need this baby to be with somebody super rich. What I want is to live near, for the baby to know me and even call me mom, and maybe I can be friends with the two women who adopt her. Mom, I echo, have you talked to the other people who might adopt your baby? Yeah, she says, Two women from Chicago told her that the Windy City has a great gay pride parade, that they could all march together, and that she could live near them. They even promised to name the child Tainan. When I ask where she got the name, she proudly reports that she made it up. I know I can't make them do it, she finishes a little more quietly. I don't tell her that courts enforce some adoption agreements. Could I promise to name a child Tainan when I'm set on either Beatrice or Walter? If I did, I'd have to keep my word, having made a career of championing family contracts. Connie's next words cut off all other thoughts. Maybe you and I could get together. Wouldn't that be weird? If I gave you the baby and then we fell in love, I could still be the mother. I flash on a future with Connie and her anger management problems <laughs> and say that it sounds like she's inclined to go with a Chicago couple. Why would I choose a single mother? I'm a single mother. Besides, she continues, I'm still hoping I can figure out a way to get my dad to let me keep it. So a month after this happens, I, I do get pregnant, and, and the little boy who's named Walter is, is uh, 11 years old, and everything is, is going fine. Um, and yet this little stop in adoption 
really shaped how I feel about families. And when I wrote the two chapters in Love's Promises about my argument that post-adoption contact agreements should be legally binding, because I'm a lawyer, I like legal tools, um, I came across one of the leading cases that came out of the Maryland Court of Special Appeals in 1983. So Maryland was, is not always on the forefront, <laughs> but in 1983, Maryland was on the forefront of recognizing that step-parent adoptions could involve a post-adoption contact agreement. And indeed, I think in many ways, that's the least controversial kind of method that a birth genetic parent can hold on to one of the sticks of parenthood, visitation, and then allow all the others, decisions about vaccines and homework and religious, to go to the now adoptive parent who's married to the, to the other genetic parent. So what I'm going to do is read from my description of the case, um, and it's the step-parent exception to the general rule that generally a child can only have two parents. Um, with the argument of, we've talked about how it's intimidating to deal with the law if you're a lawyer. And if you're not a lawyer and in crisis, how much more so? So I wrote this material about the law in a way that I hope will be accessible to people reading on a treadmill or reading at the beach, and therefore um, introduce people to um, things they need to know. As Sandman said, sometimes it's better to have half or partial representation or knowledge of the law than absolutely none. So this is a step-parent exception, Weinschel versus Stropel, it's 1983. Bruno and Sally Ann Weinchel, a well-off couple with homes in Florida and Vail, made their post-adoption contact agreement, or PACA. At the same time, they resolved their drawn-out custody battle. They were no strangers to family contracting, having entered two reconciliation agreements en route to divorce. When the dust settled, Bruno had custody of their children, Lisa and Dana, then nine and six years old. Sally had generous alimony, around $775,000, paid over three years, and visitation, a month in the summer and weeks at Christmas and spring break, in addition to letters and phone calls. But the alimony was contingent on Sally consenting to Bruno's new wife, Shirley, adopting the kids. That meant a court terminating Sally's legal rights and duties regarding her daughters, save for post-adoption contact. They all did their part for two years until Lisa's tutoring conflicted with Sally's visitation time. If Sally, Bruno, and Shirley had gotten along well enough to find a new time to visit, we'd never know about the case. But Bruno and Shirley had an agenda to cut Sally off from the children by denying phone contact, returning mail, offering the children rewards to cut visits short, and refusing to let the children call Sally mommy. They justified their conduct by claiming that it was confusing for the children to have two moms. The lower court took the extreme step of undoing the adoption, reasoning that adoption, by definition, severs all aspects of a biological parent's relationships with their kids, including visitation, making adoption with a PACA a contradiction in terms. The Maryland Court of Special Appeals disagreed, <coughs> allowing the PACA to stand, despite the unusual nature of the arrangement, because it explained, being unusual does not make it illegal against public policy are contrary to the best interests of the child. So that is where I think that the law is going and should go. Last time I took a look, it was half the states will make a post-adoption contact agreement legally binding. Um, sometimes there are limits only for children in foster care. Um, only for children over two years old, but the trend clearly seems to be going in that direction. Um, whether that is a good direction or not, and whether that legal enforcement 
should also bleed over to other legal enforcement, like a birth parent's decision to place the child with this adoptive family is another question. And hopefully, uh, both on the panel and perhaps in your questions after, we can address where that balance should be with how far legally binding agreements and non-legally binding deals should get involved in adoption and in foster care.